Shall we pray? Father in heaven, as we begin this very important study from your holy word, we ask that you will give us understanding. And not only understanding, but that you will give us the willingness to listen to your voice and to put into practice that which we learn from your holy word. We ask for the guidance of your spirit. And we ask for a submissive and tender heart. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like us to begin our study today at the book of Exodus, chapter 20, and verses 8 through 11. Exodus, chapter 20, and verses 8 through 11. This is the fourth commandment of the law of God. The law which God wrote with his own finger on tables of stone with uh, actually flames of fire according to scripture. It says here, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. And then we have the reason why God gave this commandment. Notice verse 11. It says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day, Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That is, he made it holy. Now there are two things that I want us to notice as we begin our study. First of all, the reason for the observance of this commandment is creation. It says that God gave us this commandment because in six days he made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. So this commandment is actually a creation ordinance. The second thing that I want us to notice about this verse is that it clearly tells us that God did three things with the Sabbath. First of all, we are told that he rested, and I want you to remember these words, he rested. Secondly, he blessed the Sabbath. And in the third place, we find that God hallowed it or sanctified it. He made it holy. So three ideas, resting, blessing, and hallowing. And it points us back to creation. Now, if this commandment points us back to creation, where do you suppose would be a good place to go to find out why God gave it? I think it would be a good idea for us to go back to the book of Genesis because that's where we find creation described. This commandment sends us back to Genesis. So let's go back to Genesis. We have a couple of verses that I'm going to refer to. I'm not going to read them but uh, I'm going to refer to them because we've mentioned them before. First of all we have Genesis 1 verse 1. I don't think I even have to turn in my Bible to that one. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We have three ideas. In the beginning God created heaven and earth. When we go to John chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3, we find who that creator was. It says very clearly there, in the beginning, see the same expression, in the beginning was the word, the Word was God, and then verse 3 tells us that all things were made by Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. So as we compare Genesis 1 verse 1 with John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3, there's no doubt whatsoever that the creator, creator of Genesis was none other than whom? It was none other than Jesus Christ. So if at the beginning Jesus created the Sabbath, the Sabbath is the day of Jesus. Because Jesus is the creator according to scripture. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 and discover what condition this world was in before Jesus actually created it. Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. In the beginning 
God, that's Jesus, we've already seen from John chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And now comes the verse I want to underline. The earth was without form and void. How many problems did the earth have? Two. Without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now you notice that the planet, before Jesus put it in order, before he actually performed the work of creation, of the six days of creation week, we find that the earth was without form and void. Now what does that mean, without form and void? Well, I like the translation in Spanish better because it's closer to what the original means. In Spanish it says desordenada y vacía. What does desordenada mean? There, I mean? There's some of you who know Spanish. It means in a disorderly state. And what does vacía mean? It means empty. In other words there were two problems with the planet. It was in a disorderly state and it was empty. Now what the Bible means by a disorderly state is that the planet as it was could not sustain life. In other words the planet was in a disorganized state, it could not sustain life. And so God first of all had to place the planet in order to resolve the first problem and then he had to fill it to resolve the second problem. And it's interesting as we examine the story of creation that the first three days of creation week Jesus puts the planet in order. And the last three days of creation week he fills the planet with life. Now have you ever noticed that there was a progression in the story of creation? First of all God created inanimate things, things that were not alive. He created light, He created the firmament, and He made the dry land. None of those are conscious or living. Then He proceeded to create the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then we find God creating vegetation. And we find Him creating birds. And we find Him creating fish. And we find Him creating human beings. Now what Jesus did was during the first three days of creation to prepare the planet for the living things that he was going to fill the planet worth with on the last three days. Now let's review what Jesus did during creation week. First day Jesus says let there be light and there was light. Second day let there be the firmament and as he speaks the firmament appears. By the way that's the layer of oxygen. Can any living thing survive without light? No. Can any living thing survive without oxygen? Of course not. And God knows that. Some people say why didn't God create man first if man was the most important thing? Because he would have died without having any oxygen to breathe. See God is pretty smart. The first three days he organizes the planet so that then he can fill the planet afterwards. And so the third day God said let the dry land appear because he knows that human beings are going to live on the land, hello. He knows that the, the, the land animals are going to have to live on the earth. He knows that on the earth there are going to have to be trees and plants. And so on the third day he makes the land appear and then he creates the vegetation. And at the end of the third day he looks at what he has done and he says it's good. The fourth day he now fills the heavens with heavenly bodies with the sun, the moon, and the stars and at the end of the fourth day he looks upon what he has done and Jesus says it's good. Then comes the fifth day. The waters are empty. In the daytime the skies are empty. There's no songs of birds and so on the fifth day Jesus says let the waters produce living creatures and suddenly the waters are filled with all sorts of living fish and marine animals. And then Jesus says on the fifth day let there be in the sky birds and suddenly the air is filled with birds singing their songs. Of course at this point they didn't have anybody to sing their songs to but God is going to work on that. Now do you notice that at the end of the fifth day God looks upon what he says, what he's made, Jesus does, and he sees that it is good. 
Now comes the sixth day. Do you know that on the sixth day, Jesus worked more than on any other day? Allow me to review what happened on the sixth day of creation. First of all, if you read the story in Genesis chapter 2, by the way, Genesis chapter 2 is an amplification of certain elements of chapter 1. There were not two creations. There's not the creation of Genesis 1 and the creation of Genesis 2. Genesis 2 amplifies certain details that are not contained in Genesis 1. Particularly how uh, the woman was created, how man was created, it am amplifies also several aspects about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now the first thing that Jesus made on the sixth day were the land animals. You can find that in Genesis chapter 1 and uh, verse 25 and following. Secondly, he made man. Have you ever noticed that when he made man he did not speak him into existence like he spoke everything else into existence? He gave him the personal touch. He took clay, he took dust, and he formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the Bible says that man became a living soul. Now I'd like to ask you, do you suppose that when Jesus created Adam and suddenly Adam wakes up, if we can use the expression, and uh, he's suddenly conscious, he wasn't there and now suddenly he's there, do you suppose that Adam was somewhat surprised? Do you suppose Adam asked, where did I come from? <laughs> what am I doing here? Where am I going? He must have had questions because he wasn't there and now suddenly he's there. Adam is surprised. But God does not explain to Adam at that moment the source of his existence. In fact, we find God saying after created man that there's something in creation week that is not good. Have you noticed that at the end of every week it says it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. When it gets to the part of the sixth day where God creates man, he looks at Adam and he says there is something here that is not good. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet, a helper like unto him. And so the Bible says that Jesus told Adam to name all of the animals that he had created. Now that's going to take more than five minutes. <laughs> that's going to take the better part of the sixth day. And so Adam, and there's a purpose in this, Adam starts naming all of the animals. And as he names the animals, he sees that each one of them has a mate, but he doesn't have a mate. God wanted him to feel lonely. And now in his loneliness, he's craving for a, a mate like the animals have a mate. And the Bible says that Jesus says it's not good for, for Adam to be alone. And so you have the first anesthesia of human history. General anesthesia. And Adam is put to sleep. And then you have the first surgery of human history. The Bible says that God, Jesus, opened up Adam's side and he took out one of Adam's ribs and out of the rib he made a woman. And now suddenly you can imagine Adam shaking off the effects of the anesthesia. <laughs> and uh, you know he was sleeping, he didn't know what was going on and then suddenly he wakes up and here comes Jesus walking along with Eve next to his side because the Bible says that God brought Eve to Adam. See, you don't go out hunting for a mate. God brings the mate to you. If you go hunting, you might run into trouble. <laughs> and, so, and so God, Jesus, brings Eve to Adam and I can just only imagine somewhat what Adam must have said. He must have said, wow! Where did you come from? You're beautiful. You're just like me. You stand erect. And you're able to communicate. You're able to talk. How wonderful. Where did you come from? By the way, have you noticed that not once in all of this creation story did Adam or Eve see anything, see God create anything? This is amazing. Even when he created Eve, he put Adam to sleep. In other words, the only proof, if you can speak of proof, that Adam and Eve had that God was their creator was what? 
the fact that God told them that he was their creator. They had no scientific proof, they had no empirical proof, they had no historical proof, they had no proof whatsoever. The only proof or evidence, if you please, that they had that Jesus was their creator is the fact that Jesus told them that he was their creator. They had to accept it by faith. They had to trust God's word. By the way, do you know that the whole controversy in human history is over God's word? You can boil everything down to God's Word. We studied that in our last lecture. What the devil is trying to do in Genesis chapter 3 is shake the trust of Adam and Eve in God's Word. And we notice that he uses five methods. First method, signs and wonders. You know, accept the sign and the wonder instead of what I've said. The second method is for the devil to actually change God's Word. God has said you can't eat of any tree of the garden to get Eve to exaggerate God's Word. God told us not to touch it. And later on we'll find that the devil will actually, uh, will actually quote God's Word correctly but he'll leave certain portions out like in Psalm 91. See he quoted Psalm 91 correctly but he left a portion of it out. And so if, if you leave a portion out can, it can leave a totally different and wrong impression. And then of course we find that the devil tried to get Adam and Eve to follow their senses. He tried to get Adam and Eve to follow their reasoning powers and he used Eve a person to tempt Adam. So the devil uses five methods to try and get God's people to disobey his clear, explicit, simple word. Adam and Eve were supposed to accept that Jesus was their creator because Jesus told them that he was their creator. After all there could have been other explanations, right? Couldn't they have come into existence by a big bang? I suppose so. Couldn't they have come into existence by spontaneous generation? I suppose so. And that's what the devil wanted Eve to believe. He says, oh this story of God that he's your creator and that you, when you eat from the tree you're going to die. Oh come on. You actually believe that? You, you, have, you trust that? Oh come on now. You see what God knows is that if you eat from that tree you're going to be just like him. You're going to be other gods around. And God doesn't want other gods around. He's the only one who wants to be God. And so he intimidates you into thinking that if you eat you're going to die. You're not going to die. You're going to be just like him. And God doesn't want any rivals. Do you see what this temptation really involves? It's much more serious than what most, most people think. Now we need to take a look at Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3. Do you remember the three things that are mentioned in uh, Exodus chapter 20, the fourth commandment of the law of God, the three ideas? What did God do with the Sabbath? He what? He rested. Secondly, He blessed. And then the third, He sanctified or made holy. Now is the Sabbath of Genesis the same Sabbath, as Sabbath of Exodus 20? Do you think so? Notice Exodus, uh, rather Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3. It says, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Question, did Jesus in Genesis do the very three, three things that are mentioned in the fourth commandment of the law of God? Did he rest? Yes. Did he bless? Yes. Did he make holy or sanctify? Yes. Is the fourth commandment referring to the same Sabbath that was made at the beginning? Absolutely. There's no doubt whatsoever. The Sabbath is a creation ordinance. Now let me ask you, do you think that God had to bless the Sabbath for himself? Listen folks, God is the source of all blessing. Why would he have to bless a day for himself? He's infusing the day with a blessing not for himself but for others. Everything that God blesses is for others in scripture, never for himself. So God blessed the seventh day Sabbath. He infused the day with life, health, and prosperity because anytime you find the word blessing in scripture it has to do with life, with abundance, with prosperity, with, with which is good. Did God have to make a day holy for himself? He says, oh I'm going to make a holy day for myself. Listen, for God all days are holy. 
because everything connected with God is holy. And so God didn't have to set apart a day, a holy day for Himself. Did God really need to rest in fact? The fact is that we're going to notice in a few moments that God did not have to rest. Jesus did not have to rest. I mean, how much rest do you need after saying, let there be light? Let there be the firmament? Let there be dry land? Let there be uh, trees and plants and grass? Let there be the sun, the moon, and the stars? Let there be fish, let there be birds, let there be land animals. You know God at the end of creation week He says, wow I've really worked, I need a vacation. <laughs> Is God resting because He's tired? Is Jesus resting because He's tired? Absolutely not! Then the question is, why is he resting? We'll get to that in a moment. But before that, allow me to mention one other thing which is extremely important. Do you know that the story of creation says that Jesus actually finished his work twice? Now you say, how can you finish your work twice? Well, let's notice Genesis chapter 1 verse 31. There's a very interesting nuance here. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31 and we'll continue reading through chapter 2. Genesis 1 verse 31 and we'll go on to read chapter 2. It says there, then God, that is Jesus, saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. When did he finish? It says it was the evening and the morning of the sixth day, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. He finished the sixth day according to this verse. But then you read the next verse, it appears to have a contradiction. It says in verse 2, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. Now wait a minute. Did he finish on the sixth or did he end on the seventh? Maybe Moses forgot what he wrote in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. And he says, oh, excuse me, it wasn't the sixth day that he finished, it was the seventh day that he finished. Actually there's something else that's going on here, and let me explain it. I had the privilege of working for four and a half years uh, in New Mexico. All of New Mexico was my territory in West Texas. I lived in Amarillo, Texas. And one of the places which I really enjoyed visiting was Taos, New Mexico. Any of you ever been to Taos, New Mexico? Beautiful country up there. Uh, you know that's God's country. Wonderful. Uh, especially in the winter it gets beautiful because of all of the mountains. But anyway, something which Taos has, uh, which I'm sure other places have but it impacted me, is a huge number of art galleries. They have so many artists. Many of them are Native Americans. And, uh, and you know you can go to their shop and you can see them actually painting works of art. And uh, I had the privilege while I was there, I had a series of uh, meetings for three weeks one time, in fact it was on Genesis, this was many years ago, and uh, I used to enjoy going to the art galleries and watch the artists work. And you know what they would do? What they would do is they would first of all take a frame, a wooden frame, and then they would staple a piece of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Canvas, a piece of canvas over the frame. They would make sure that it was nice and tight, they would place it on the easel, and then they would sit down, and I'm dramatizing for effect, they would sit down and they would uh, put some colors on the canvas, and after they finished the first day of work, uh, they would look at the canvas and say, it looks good. And then the second day they would come and they would add a few colors there, they would perhaps add, perhaps add a few clouds in the sky, and then after a day's work they would look and they would say, hmm, looks good. Then they would come the third day and they would add some hills and they would add some mountains and some trees and some plants and some flowers and at the end of the third day they would look and they would say hmm looks good. Then the fourth day they would sit down and they would probably uh, you know uh, paint a sun in the sky and they would add a few more colors to the canvas and at the end of the fourth day they look at their work and they say hmm looks good. And the fifth day they would have uh, jumping out of a lake, you know, some fish, and they would uh, color some birds flying through the air, and at the end of the fifth day they would look and they would say, hmm, looks real good. 
And then the sixth day they would sit down and they would add some giraffes and some elephants and different kinds of animals on the canvas. And, uh, and then they would uh, you know, paint a woman and a man perhaps there enjoying the beautiful scenery. And then they would add the final touches to the canvas and look and say, it is very good. Now let me ask you, was the work of art finished? I said they finished. I said he finished. Is the work of art finished? Yes and no. The work itself is finished, but what is lacking? The signature of the author of the work of art. Without identifying who made it, hello, anybody can come along and claim it. But the fact is that the picture was finished, the work of art was finished, but then the artist would take the, the what do you call it, brush, see I'm not an artist, <laughs> he would take the brush and he would sign his name to the work of art. And then the work was finished. If we apply this to creation, now we understand how Jesus finished his work twice. The sixth day he finished a work of art. And by the way, this work of art was not a static that when you look at it, it's always the same. This was a living picture. It was a picture that changed at every instant, at every moment. He made this beautiful world, this beautiful work of art. But Jesus knew that it was necessary to identify who was the one who made this work of art. And that's the reason why he created the Sabbath. The Sabbath identifies the Creator. The Sabbath is the signature of Jesus upon his work of creation. It tells us who made all of these things. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, I mentioned that God wasn't tired. Jesus wasn't tired when he finished creation week. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 40. In verse 28, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28. Here we find an interesting declaration about creation and about the Creator. I want you to notice this interesting statement of the prophet Isaiah. It says here, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary his understanding is unsearchable does the creator get weary according to this verse was Jesus tired at the end of creation week absolutely not by the way was man tired I don't know whether you've stopped to think about this man was created on the second half of the first day so his first day on earth, first full day on earth was a day of what? Was a day of rest. Now this is strange. God rests and he's not tired. And man hadn't worked and so he rests and he's not tired either. Why would you have God and man resting on the Sabbath if neither one of them are tired? There must be a deeper purpose to the observance of the Sabbath than physical rest. Are you understanding what I'm saying? There's a deeper dimension to the Sabbath than physical rest. Because Adam wasn't tired, Eve wasn't tired, God wasn't tired either. And by the way, have you ever noticed in the creation story that Adam and Eve did none of the work? How much work of creation did Adam and Eve perform? Nothing. And so when the seventh day comes around, God says to Adam and Eve, I'm going to come down to the garden, and I want you, Adam, and you, Eve, to spend the Sabbath with me. I want us to rest together. And you say, well, that's not what Genesis says. Genesis says that God rested. That's true. 
But notice what Jesus says in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. And we'll read verse 28 also. Notice Jesus, who was the creator of the Sabbath, what he has to say. Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for whom? The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of what? Lord of the Sabbath. For whom was the Sabbath made? The Sabbath was not made for God because God doesn't need a Sabbath of rest. The Sabbath was made for man. And yet God rested and He invited man to rest. Now why would they rest together? Let me dramatize what happened that first Sabbath. By the way, the last thing that God makes uh, on the sixth day is marriage. Do you notice that? He calls Adam and Eve and he says, uh, Adam, Eve, uh, stand right here in front of me. Uh, we're going to have our first marriage here. And he pronounces those words. What God has joined together, let not man cast asunder. I declare you man and wife. He didn't say that. But he married them. And immediately after he marries them, the holy hours of the Sabbath begin. Now have you noticed that during creation week, the first six days... God made things. On the seventh day He made holy time. This shows us that time is more important than what? Than things. In fact, during the six days of labor and work, we remember the things of God. Whereas on the seventh day the purpose is to remember the God of things. Now, Allow me to mention what happened on that first Sabbath. God calls Adam and Eve. He's resting with them. It says so in Genesis. And uh, Jesus says to Adam, Well, Adam, what do you think? Well, Lord, you could have made that tree a little bit taller over there. <laughs> I don't think so. Jesus says, Do you like what you see? What do you think Adam said? Wow. How about those birds over there? Amazing. How about this, this wife that I gave you? Wow. How about this husband? Oh, marvelous. In other words, on that day, Jesus met with Adam and Eve, and they contemplated his work of creation. God said, all of this that you see, I made for you. It is my gift for you. But you might forget where this came from. So what I want us to do is every seventh day you're going to interrupt your activities. You're going to interrupt your endeavors. And for 24 whole hours I'm going to come to the garden and we're going to contemplate what I made for you. The focus is going to shift from you to me. By the way, have you noticed that on the sixth day God made Adam king of creation? He gave Adam and Eve dominion, the Bible says. But by creating the seventh day, God is saying to Adam and Eve, you are lords of creation, but the seventh day shows that I am your Lord. Because I made you. You're my creatures. And so every seventh day, Jesus promised to come and meet with Adam and Eve so that they could contemplate His works of creation, His marvelous works of creation. And in this way their hearts would be filled with reverence and with love and with gratefulness because of the love and the wisdom of Jesus in giving them this gift. Notice that they had not worked for it. It was a gift. Is this true of salvation too? See, this is part two. We're not dealing with the Sabbath and salvation in our lecture today. We're going to deal with that tomorrow because the Sabbath has an additional dimension. You see, the purpose of the Sabbath is to show that Jesus works and we simply receive His gift and accept it. And keeping the Sabbath is a sign that we believe that He is the Creator and that we're thankful and grateful to Him and that we worship Him because He is our Creator. How about it? Can you imagine Adam saying, you mean to say that I have to take a whole day a week? 
out of my busy schedule and we have 24 hours to spend all of my things so that we can just talk about you and what you've done how is it Lord that you deliver unto me this yoke of bondage you know what I think Adam said what Eve said they said uh, uh, Jesus uh, couldn't we meet every day because if they love Jesus would they want to spend that time of fellowship with Jesus yes the sixth day Jesus says Adam I made you for Eve Eve I made you for Adam but the seventh day says Adam and Eve I made you for me I am your Lord I am your creator I made you for fellowship suspend your things and just come and enjoy rest with me that was the original intent of the Holy Sabbath and God knew that people might forget it that's why in the fourth commandment he says remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy do you think that if the Sabbath was necessary at creation in a perfect world with a perfect Adam and Eve if it was necessary to remind them about their roots the source of their existence how wonderful their creator was how much he loved he had for them by giving them all of these things free of charge without their working for them do you think that Adam and Eve needed to remember who the creator was obviously yes because the Sabbath was created for that purpose now it's interesting that some individuals say that the Sabbath was okay in the Old Testament but that the Sabbath does not apply to Christians today I once had an interesting conversation with a pastor friend he was not a pastor of the same church that I belong to and just to play devil's advocate I said to him you know what I believe that it's perfectly okay for a man to marry a man and a woman to marry a woman no I don't believe that <laughs> but I said that to him and he, his eyes bulged and he looked at me and says you as a pastor would say that you think that a man can marry a man and a woman a woman I said sure why not and he looked at me and he says the answer is obvious the Bible says that at the beginning God made Adam and Eve and he performed the first marriage between a man and a woman and then I had him where I wanted him <laughs> and I looked at him and I said okay good point what else did Jesus make at creation week and boy you should have seen him you could have heard a pin drop <laughs> and I'm still waiting for his answer <laughs> you see the Sabbath was made at the same time as marriage and so if you say the that marriage still applies between a man and a woman and you argue, argue on the basis of creation you must also argue on the basis of creation that the Sabbath is still binding and by the way some people say the Sabbath was for the Jews listen up to what I'm going to say the Sabbath no place in the Bible does it say that the Sabbath was the Sabbath of the Jews furthermore Adam was not a Jew because the name Jew comes from Judah one of the sons of Jacob in fact the Sabbath some people say well the Sabbath was a symbol of the rest that we have in Jesus when he died on the cross to give us a spiritual rest listen folks when the Sabbath was created there was no need for any Redeemer because man had not sinned the Sabbath is part of God's original plan for man it is not an afterthought of God well I'll give them the Sabbath now to show them the rest that I'm going to give them someday when I die on the cross there was no need for a cross when the Sabbath was created there was no Jew so you can't say that the Sabbath was made for the Jews am I making myself clear the Sabbath is a creation institution now I'd like to ask the question when does the Sabbath begin this is very important you know some people say I keep Sunday and what they do is go to church on Sunday <laughs> it's not the same to go to church on Sunday or go to church on Saturday Saturday as observing the Sabbath the way the Bible says notice Genesis chapter 1 and verse 5 Genesis chapter 1 and verse 5 this is a formula that is used each day of creation it says there in verse 5 God called the light day and the darkness he called night 
So the evening and the morning were the first day. Did you notice the order? What comes first, the evening or the morning? According to this, it's the evening and the morning. And by the way, the word evening means sunset. Go with me to Mark chapter 1 and verse 32. Mark chapter 1 and verse 32. Here it's speaking about the healings of Jesus. And these are the words that we find. At evening, notice the same word, at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed. When is evening? When the sun what? When the sun sets. And it says in the Bible, from evening till evening shall you keep your what? Your Sabbaths. Now let me ask you, do you know why we have a week today? Why does a week have seven days? Do you know that every measurement of time that we have has an astronomical explanation? Except one. Our year is the amount of time that it takes our earth to make one complete revolution around the sun. 365 and a quarter days. Has an astronomical explanation. Our month, technically speaking, is the period between one new moon and another. The day is the amount of time that it takes our planet to make one complete turn on its axis. Every one of those measurements has an astronomical explanation. There's one measurement of time that has no astronomical explanation and that is the week. Why does the week have seven days? It could have ten. It could have five. Why does it have seven days? Simply because that's the way that God made the Sabbath, that Jesus made the week and the Sabbath at the beginning of human history. And the weekly cycle has continued uninterrupted since that time. By the way, do you know that there are some people that say, well, you know, that's okay, but we don't know whether the Sabbath today is the same Sabbath that existed way back then. We don't know whether the weekly cycle has been broken. Biblically we can show that the weekly cycle has not been broken. By the way, Christians have no problem saying that the Sunday we keep is the Sunday Jesus resurrected. It's just the Sabbath that, we, that, Ad, that, that Adventists keep that isn't the same Sabbath. But the Sunday that we keep today is the same Sunday as the resurrection. You can't have it both ways. If the Sunday that is observed today is supposedly in honor of the resurrection of Jesus, then the day before Sunday, the Sabbath, is also the same Sabbath. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And if the Sabbath today is the same Sabbath as it was in the days of Christ, and Jesus kept that Sabbath because we find in Luke chapter 4 and verse 16 that it was a cus the custom of Jesus to go to the synagogue to observe the Sabbath. Now listen up to what I'm going to say. If Jesus kept the same Sabbath which we keep today, which is true astronomically and historically, even Christians recognize that because they observe Sunday in honor of the resurrection of Jesus. If that's true, then we have to conclude that the Sabbath that Jesus observed is the same Sabbath of creation because do you think Jesus would be observing the wrong Sabbath being the creator of the Sabbath in his day? Are you understanding my point? If the Sabbath of Christ day is the same Sabbath as today and Jesus kept it and Jesus created the Sabbath it must be the same Sabbath that he made at the beginning because the creator would not be observing the wrong day. In fact, if you look, at a, a look, and I'll just mention this, at Luke 23, 54, through Luke 21, 24 and verse 1, you'll find the sequence of days. They've, it very clearly says there that Jesus died on the preparation day. The day before the Sabbath, it says there, Jesus died. Then it says that the women rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. And then we're told in Luke 24 verse 1 that Jesus resurrected on the first day of the week. So there you have the sequence. You have Friday, his death. By the way, Christians keep Good Friday. Isn't it interesting how the Sabbath gets lost during Holy Week? They speak about Palm Sunday. And in, among Hispanics, uh, Holy Thursday is particularly important. Jueves Santo. Oh, that's a very important day. 
and uh, you know crucifixion Friday and resurrection Sunday who says anything about the Sabbath it's lost in the shuffle because there's one who doesn't want us to remember the Creator who would that be Satan so you find the sequence of days is the same by the way did you notice that in the commandment and in Genesis it doesn't say keep one day in seven every day is a Sabbath worship every seventh day because some Christians say yeah I worship I worship every seventh day that's not what the Bible says the Bible says that the Sabbath is the seventh day the same seventh day of creation the same seventh day that Jesus kept is the same seventh day today and it's a day when Jesus wants us to suspend all of our activities and he wants us to forget about our business and about our work and about our endeavors and our recreation he says forget the things that I have made and now we're going to reflect and we're going to think about our relationship quality time in the rat race of life how about it is this a blessing do you need a break I do actually I work harder on Sabbath than any other day but it's a different kind of work the priests offered double sacrifices on the Sabbath but it was a delight for them I delight to have all of the church family together and, and enjoy uh, the fellowship and the church programming and, and you know the, the corporate worship it's, it's absolutely beautiful now do you know that the Sabbath is the only day in the Bible that is declared to be holy by the way some people say all the days are holy I keep every day the Bible never says you're supposed to keep every day it says six days you're supposed to work the seventh day is the Sabbath that we're supposed to keep holy listen if all days are holy then God would not be able to separate the Sabbath as holy because in order to separate one day as holy you have the rest of the days have to be secular days hello are you catching my point in order to separate a holy day that means that the other ones aren't holy for example I have a, a church hymnal and I have my Bible well not, let's not use a church hymnal let's use a history book that we use in college are they different yes do they have paper do they have covers do they have a name sure they're exactly the same right no what separates the Bible from other books God it's God's holy word how about the, the tithe? Is the tithe? I put a, a dollar bill into the offering plate and have a dollar bill in my pocket. Are they the same? Don't they both have George Washington? Yes they do. But are they the same? No, because one is secular and the other is what? The other is holy. You have this building and you have other buildings. You have City Hall. Is this building different than City Hall? It most certainly is because this building is what? it's been separated for a holy use and so six days are secular and one day which Jesus has separated is holy the seventh day according to scripture some people say well hasn't it been changed? why would God change it? why would Jesus change it? nowhere in the Bible do you find that it says that the day was changed no place do you find Jesus saying well folks now we're not supposed to keep Sabbath anymore uh, because I resurrected now we're going to start keeping Sunday there's no thus saith the Lord there's no command like the Bible commands us to observe the seventh day Sabbath some people say it doesn't really matter pastor which day we keep as long as we're sincere and, and we keep we dedicate one day to the Lord do you think God accepts a secular day that we offer him instead of the holy day that he has established? you remember the story of Nadab and Abihu? God said bring holy fire into the sanctuary and they were a little under the influence of alcohol and the Bible says you can read this in Leviticus chapter 10 they, they entered into the sanctuary with common ordinary everyday fire not the holy fire from the altar by the way if you looked at those fires would they look alike? sure if you put your finger in both fires would your finger be burnt? if you analyze the chemical qualities of the fires would they be the same? 
Yes, so why was the fire from the altar different than the fire that they used for cooking? Because the fire on the altar God made what? Holy, and God said bring holy fire. And so they bring common ordinary fire and they present it to the Lord and God says, oh who cares, fire is fire. No way. The Bible says that the glory of, Lord, of the Lord destroyed Nadab and Abihu. It's one of those references that people don't like to read because they say, ooh, you know, God is <laughs> destroyed them. What was the principle? They took something which was common and they presented it to God as if it was what? Holy. How do you suppose God feels when we take a common day of work and present it to Him as if it were holy? Is it the same principle? The first day of the week is a day of work. Six days you shall labor. The first day is the first day of labor. To bring that day and present it to Him as a holy day is the same principle. God, if we know what His will is, will not accept that. Some people say, well, Pastor, we're under grace. We're not under the law. So does that mean you can commit adultery now? You can go out and kill someone, right? You can go lie. You can covet. You can worship idols. Can you do all those things? Is it okay? Oh no, you can't do that. Then why does a different principle apply to the Sabbath? He who offends in one point is guilty of all, according to Scripture. So just because we're under grace doesn't give us the license to disobey God's holy law. Some people say it was for the Jews. Never once does the Bible speak of the Sabbath as the Sabbath of the Jews. There was no Jew when it was established. Oh, but isn't Sunday the Lord's Day? No, it isn't. 23 times in Scripture we are told that the Lord's Day is the Sabbath. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Never once is, does the Bible present the first day of the week as a day of rest. Some people say, well, Jesus broke the Sabbath. We'll deal with this accusation tomorrow. Listen, if Jesus broke the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments, Jesus was a sinner. And Jesus needs a Redeemer. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Serious implications. And by the way, if Jesus broke the Sabbath, then the Pharisees were right. Are you going to take the side of the Pharisees? Are you going to accuse Jesus of sinning? Jesus did not break the Bible Sabbath. He broke the Sabbath of the Pharisees. Which is not the same Sabbath. Because the Pharisees had made it a yoke of bondage. It was a day of restrictions and rules and regulations that made people miserable. The original intention of just enjoying the whole day and basking in God's presence and taking a break from our things and just resting in God and enjoying what He has done, what He has given, that had been lost. The delight had become a day of misery and bondage and Jesus came to deliver the Sabbath from bondage. Some people say it was beyond repair so He got rid of it. Well the fact is that marriage was also beyond repair. So I guess we got to get rid of marriage too. Jesus addressed the issue. You get divorced for any old reason, Jesus said. So if you apply it to the Sabbath, you have to apply it to marriage. You, we can't pick and choose. Some people say, but pastor, how can the majority be wrong? Well, you show me one time in history when the majority was right. In the days of Noah, how many were right? Eight! And the Bible says only one, the others tag along. <laughs> Let me ask you, in the days of Daniel, did he stand alone? Yes, he did. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when the multitudes met in the valley of Dura, did Daniel stand alone? He most certainly did. How about Elijah? Did he stand alone? He sure did. Did Jesus stand alone? He even felt that his father had forsaken him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The fact is, folks, that the majority is never right. Because the majority, as a general rule, does not want to order their lives in harmony with what God teaches. It takes too much effort. It cramps our lifestyle. And so people, instead of following what God says, 
they follow the crowd they follow peer pressure they trust their religious leaders folks we cannot blindly trust our religious leaders I'm not saying that we should not respect our pastors what I'm saying is we should not blindly follow them we should compare what they teach with what the Holy Word of God says and we should follow the Word we can always trust the Word some Christians say well we have signs and wonders don't you believe it some ministers quote the Word out of context be careful go check it out for yourself some people follow their reasoning well I honor Jesus on resurrection day that's human reasoning some people follow the testimony of their senses some follow the peer pressure of others we can only follow and trust the Word of God do you remember that in our last lecture we said that the genuine always comes before the counterfeit now let's apply that principle to the day of worship which was the original genuine day of worship that Jesus made for the human race there's no doubt do you think the devil later on in history would have another day to rival the Sabbath the devil has a counterfeit for everything that God has true so the devil would obviously want to have a different day of worship I pray to God that we will all choose to spend this time with Jesus how about it?